what happened this week is we began to ask some questions on relationships. That the, We asked you, what are some of the questions you've been asking or you have on relationships? And this week, we got a flood of those questions coming into the church. And I started looking at them, and I thought, you know what we need to do? Is instead of answering one or two of these from the stage, we, what if we just took Valentine's Day, took this morning to sit down and have a conversation and answer some of the questions that are being asked by the church? Do you know that when Paul the Apostle wrote the a lot of the New Testament was him answering questions that the church was asking. Did you know that? Like 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. What are those books? It's, it's Paul responding to questions that had been asked um, by the church. And so we thought, what if we took a morning and just answered some of the questions? Because here's what I believe. If one person's ans- asking it and is as willing to write it down, even though it's like anonymous, that should be pretty easy to do. Come on, people. It's not going to say the question and your name. It's just the question. Um, but if one person's asking it, there's probably a lot of people that can benefit from the answer. Amen? So here's what we're going to do this morning. Something a little bit different. Get yourselves cozy. And we are going to move through some of these questions. We've broken them down into categories, and we're going to wrestle them with them together biblically this morning. And to make that happen, can we do that this morning, church? You all right with me? Are you okay with this? I don't feel like I have permission, but that's okay. We're going to do it anyway. To help me out with that, I'm going to ask my beautiful bride and Valentine to come on up here. This is my wife, Tatum Norman. Come on, church. She's gorgeous. She's beautiful. Hi, love. Look, she's organizing me. She brought my stuff. And oh, thank you, sweetie. Good. You're now, ready. Now you, good morning, church. Now you've seen you? into our relationship a little bit. Hi, baby. Love you. They wouldn't turn her mic on until she kissed me for a service. I told them not to. Said, don't turn her mic on until she kisses me. Um, I kissed her last week on stage, and afterwards I got in trouble. She said, gave me his cheek. She said, that was like a, like a brother-sister kiss. I'm like, what the heck do you want on stage, girl? That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to spend some time. Tatum, would you mind just praying over our morning this morning as we get into this? Let's do it. God, we just thank you, Lord, today as we... Um, It's Valentine's Day, God, and we say celebrate love. We celebrate your great love for us today, Lord, your love that died on our behalf, God, that has forgiven us of our sins and given us eternal life, God. Lord, we just pray that as we go through these questions this morning, Lord, that you would teach us from your word, Lord, how to apply these things to our life, Lord, areas that that we need help in, that we need to be challenged in, that we need to change, God. We pray that you would just uh, speak to our hearts this morning in a powerful way, God, and, Lord, that we would leave this place, Lord, better, Lord, than when we came in, God, and Lord, that you would just continue to do a work in each one of our lives, Lord, and God, we just ask that you would fill this time, Lord, with your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Come on, church, amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Dustin. Um, As we go through this today, I really pray that, that, so get out your notepads, because I I really believe God's going to speak to you and and show you some things. We're going to look at some questions that the church has been asking, and um, and some of them are, you know, they're pretty heavy and some stuff that we got to wrestle through together. And for every question that we ask, where do we turn? The Word of God. All right, kid. Mark, what church is this? <laughs> for every question we ask, we turn to the Word of God. God's Word is the authority in our lives, okay? you got to understand that. And so these are not just things like me and Tatum going, I don't know, what do you think? What do you want to tell them? You know, it's like, you know, we got to... It's like you don't want, listen, the last thing you want is my opinion. Amen? No, no, we don't need that guy's opinion. We need God's word. And so we, we submit ourselves to God's word. God's word edits us. We don't edit it. We, we place our lives under its authority. We don't stand above it and decide what we like and don't like. And we don't cut from it. We don't edit God's word. It edits us. And so in other words, in, in other words today, we, I say that because we might read some things today. And you're like, I don't know if I like that. Well, God didn't ask you if you liked it. God is just saying, here's, here's how this works, okay? And he's the author of life. He's the author of the word that tells us how to live life. And so David in the Psalms would say things like this, like, I love the law, Psalm 119. He'd go on and on about his love for the law, and you're kind of like, David, it's a law. Like, why do you love a law? Who loves laws? Like, I do not love the speed limit law. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. But David had a more mature approach to the law and said, I understand that God, who knows how life works, gave us the law telling us how life works and keeps us in the bounds, uh, coloring inside the lines of how life is supposed to work. So we always look to God's word. Amen, church? So we're going to do that today as we wrestle through some of these questions. 
And um, here we go. It's going to be fun. You ready? Here we go. First question is this. Um, that's not it. But here it is. I feel obligated to help two people reconcile. They're not talking, and I'm in the middle of it. Anyone ever been there before? Come on. Anyone ever been there before? Come on. Who's there right now? Okay, don't keep your hand up. You're like, these guys are fighting. I'm literally in the middle of them. I was kidding. Um, they're not talking. I'm in the middle of it. The question is this. I truly want to help them because I love them both. Not sure what I uh, should or shouldn't do. Give me some advice, they say. So. I can tackle that. I, mean, I talk all the time, baby. I'm, okay, I'm going to sit here like this and watch you tackle <laughs> all these right. things. So. First of all, um, yes, as you were saying, we always, you know, within relationships, there's always going to be tension uh, and fights will arise. And, and how do you handle this, especially if you're caught in the middle of tension between two people that you love and you care for and you want to see reconciliation take place? And um, first of all, I'd want to let you know that um, you cannot force reconciliation that it has to be those two people have to come to that decision that they want to reconcile. But I do believe that you can play a part in trying to help them reconcile um, as kind of a mediator. And I would encourage you in the light of God's word and giving them God's word to, to go to each one of them separately and, and try to encourage them and maybe shed some light on the situation. Maybe show them, hey, you kind of were at fault in this area or this is maybe something that you could have worked on or, hey, did you know that so-and-so is going through this and maybe that's why they reacted that way. So you could go and help kind of spend some time with each one of them and help shed some light on, on the situation in hopes that one of them, at least one of them, would be willing to go to the other. And so you don't want to play that middle man who's like, okay, well, I'll go tell him you said that. Okay, well, I'll go tell him you said that. I would just encourage them. You encourage them as best as you can and then say, all right, now you need to go and talk to so-and-so and get this thing worked out um, in hopes that there would be reconciliation. And the reason you're doing that, the reason you're telling them, go talk to that person, is because it's biblical, right? Matthew 18. Um, you're to go to that person. And so people will, you know, you ever have people come up to you and they, they you like, when did I become the county dump? In other words, like you show up with your dump truck, boom, all this all your junk and all of your trash, you're, dump, you're dumping on me. And you're like, where's that sign? Like, does it say, dump your trash on me? I don't think so. Um, so when people begin to, and you feel it, you sense it, so-and-so, like, their, their truck, they're dumping everything on you. you got to be like, hold up. Um, let's put that back down, and you need to go to them because that's the biblical thing. So what she's saying is it's a, it's a biblical truth. You, tell, you go talk to them. You go talk and diffuse the situation right there. So someone starts going, I can't believe so-and-so. Did you see what they did? You're not supposed to go, what? what they do? Oh, my goodness. Really? Tell me more. <laughs> let's pray about it. Give me all the details in prayer. God, <laughs> just make, I'll agree with you in prayer, sister. That's right. Amen. And what you're doing is you're gossiping and you're not really praying. And so you got to just be like, listen, you need to go talk with, with them, is what, Tate, what Tate's saying. And it's a biblical truth. You push them to talk to them. Do you just have something else you want to add? To that? No, I just, Proverbs 15 1 says, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And so if it gets to the point where you're just stirring up anger every time you have a conversation, then that's probably the time that say, okay, I've done as much as I can do here. Um, but if you can, you know, continue to help them to come to some sort of peaceful conclusion, that's great. Awesome. Good. Is that all right? We got a whole bunch of these. Can you guys hang on for this? All right. Next question is this. Uh, you said forgiveness is not earned. So last week we did a, I think it was last week, was that last week we did a message on forgiveness and how forgiveness is not earned. It's not like, I'll forgive you when. Do any of you ever do that? I'll forgive you when you stop doing the thing I need to forgive you from. Then I'll forgive you. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is letting people go. You let them free. You don't hold them in, um, in a debt to you. You set them free. And it's not something that's earned. You just, you're, to give it, you're to give it freely. We give it because he gave it to us. Amen? I can forgive because he's forgiven me. So we need to release people. We need to forgive people. It's not, it's not earned. And they, and they say, um, well... Is there a sense, they said, how about respect? Okay. Is there a sense in which respect must be freely given in a healthy relationship? Now, we need to put this in some context in order to be able to answer the question. So what I always do when I get questions like this is I, I begin to imagine who's asking this question and what they're talking about so that we could answer the question. So 
Let's paint a picture together. Um, and I could be totally wrong, just guessing, um, so that I can answer the question. I'm picturing a wife who was here last week who has one of those husbands. And she hears me last week say, forgiveness is not earned, it's given. And she's like, dang it. I got to forgive this guy? Are you serious? This is hard. I got to forgive him. And so she last week left and went, okay, well, I guess I got to forgive him. I don't want to forgive him. But, you know, like scripture says, forgiveness is not a feeling. You're never going to feel like it. It's not always going to be something you feel like. It's what you do. You do it because it's, it's biblical. So forgiveness is not a feeling. It's an obedience to God's word. So she leaves here going, well, what about respect? I'll forgive him, but I ain't going to respect him. Right? I'm going to forgive. I don't know. I'm just guessing. You think maybe I'm close? Anybody? Maybe. Maybe that's close. It could be something else, but I'm just trying to put it in context so we can answer it. She's got, I can't. I'll forgive him, but do I, need, do I need to respect him? Again, we need to turn to Scripture. Ephesians 5, 33 says this, if you're taking notes. So, so again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself. It would be awesome to stop there, right, ladies? Like, that's good. Amen. Tell them boys to love their wives. Like they love themselves, and they love themselves. They, they're, when they do something wrong, it was just a mistake. When, when I do something wrong, you know, right? So every man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Scriptural. The wife must respect her husband. So is it freely given? Is it something that's earned in a marriage relationship? Okay, in a marriage relationship, really important. Scripturally, in order for you to have a scriptural relationship, you must give that man the respect that's maybe not due to him in the sense that he's a respectable person all the time, but in the way that's biblical, you are to respect, you are to respect him. Um, how do I respect somebody I don't respect? <laughs> right? How, do I, how am I supposed to respect a guy that just doesn't got, the, he's not very respectable? Like, what am I supposed to do? Well, I don't know. Good luck. Um, we'll move on to the next question because that's really hard to answer and I don't want to have to answer. I'm just kidding. Um, here's a few things. I would say that a lot of times, uh, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this from the angle of a wife to a husband and we can flip it around the other way too, but, but I bring this up because scripturally, usually it's the man who's wanting respect. And the woman, the wife in the relationship is wanting, do you know, what? Love. So it tells the so Bible, God knows that. And so in scripture, he says, husbands, love your wife because they need love. And then he says, and wives, uh, respect your man because they need respect. And so I'm imagining that this is a man who, who wants, wants some, some um, respect and he needs that from his wife. A lot of times, uh, a husband will not be respectable and we're going to blame it all on the husband. But sometimes, sometimes there is... There's a, there's a role that that wife plays, and, and here's what I mean. Uh, ladies, your words and the way that you treat your man can absolutely and is, according to God, by the, the covenant that you have with one another, is shaped by you and the way that you treat him, okay? And so you say he's not respectable. I say, Bible says, respect him and watch him become respectable, because, see, you, the way you treat and the way you love and the way you care will end up shaping that person, okay? God is using you in their life to shape them. So, well, how, how do I do that? Let me break, the, break it down into, into, some simple, into some simple things. You can respect your man even when he's not always respectable as, as be his cheerleader. Just be, be on his team, okay? Don't always make him feel like you're against him in everything. That's good, hello? Because, listen, you as a cheerleader, you speaking life into your man could absolutely change the way he approaches life, okay? I've seen this over and over again in, in, in counseling sessions. Um, a perfect example would be, and I could think of two off the top of my head, of this actually happening, of doing counseling with a husband and a wife where the husband hasn't had a job in near a year. Can I tell you something? There's absolutely nothing more demoralizing for a man to not have work. He's made to work. And when he can't find work, it's demoralizing. It hurts. 
And it doesn't help to come home to a wife who's like, why can't you find work? All the other husbands have work, and how are you lazy bum? What are you going to do, sit on the couch all day? And you think that that's going to encourage him to go out and get a job? Wrong, okay? It's not going to happen. So what you do is you end up pushing him more and more into a state of de being demoralized and, and depressed. And I've seen this where couples are coming, the husband's just like looking at the ground, beat up by life, and then beat up by the wife that he married. I mean, he's getting beat up. And so I'll, I'll ask, I'll, I'll, I'll ask that wife, look in the eyes, are you respecting him? Well, you don't have respect him. I was like, listen, start cheerleading. You know, start cheerleading. Get behind him instead of like, you can't do I can't believe you. Go like this. Husband, honey, I believe you can do this. And we're going to, God's going to come through. And I believe you're such a great man. And I, I've seen you do great things. And you've accomplished this and you accomplished this. You're not done yet. And you start speaking life. That guy's going to walk out of that meeting like, I'm getting myself a job, baby. You know what I mean? Like he's, there's just energy there because his wife's behind him. And all of a sudden he gets a job and he's working and he's holding. And, and the whole time he's got that cheerleader there. It's like every time he looks behind it, over his shoulder, you're like pom-poms. Like, you go, I got you. You're the man, right? He's like, you watch. You watch what your words of encouragement will do in his life. So he's not respectable. Well, listen, start cheerleading, okay? You want to do yourself? Listen, so be his cheerleader. Uh, be his champion. Um, you wonder to yourself, like, like my husband, my husband, it, like he does nothing around the house. <laughs> but He's always doing stuff for the neighbors, and he's always doing stuff. Why? And you're like, why in the world is that the case, you know? Well, how about when he does something nice for his neighbors, they, like, bake him brownies and bring them to the house. He's like, I will do more nice things for the neighbors. Because, like, when he does it for you at the house, you're like, finally. <laughs> like, no one wants to help you anymore when it's finally. See what I mean? So, like, respect your man and give him some, give him some, like, just champion him. Be his cheerleader and watch God change him through your words. You, you can shape him through your words. Um, be his companion. He needs a friend, guys, to be on the journey um, and, co and be complimenting him and walking with him. And so that, that's what I'd say to the, to the woman in, in this situation who's like, how, is, is respect something that I, I give out, absolutely dish out respect um, for it to be a biblical uh, marriage? Um, to the man, I would say your wife needs love. And if you're the one complaining that she doesn't respect you, you start loving her and you watch her start respecting you. And so couples get in this circle all the time, like where she's going, he needs to love me, he needs to love me. He needs, he's like, she needs to respect me. She's like, well, I'll start, I'll start respecting you when you start loving me. And he's like, well, I'm going to start loving you and you respect me. And no one goes anywhere. Just be the, be the, um, be the one to break that cycle and just start Men invest love into your wives, and wives, you invest that respect into them, and you watch that thing get healthy. Amen? You with me, church? It's, it's important. It's important um, to understand that. Men, you're to love your wives as Christ loved the church. How do you love the church? He gave himself for her. In other words, he sacrificed himself for the one he loves. And men, we're to sacrifice ourselves for our wives. And um, you become that kind of man, that, that's, that's worthy of some respect, you know, in loving her in the way that you're called to. So... That is my short <laughs> answer. <laughs> just kidding. That's good. I, I want to add to that real quick. Oh, I also, oh okay, yeah. <laughs> I thought I hit it out of the park. You're like. Almost out of the park. You're going to help me out a little bit? I'll help you out. This is super quick. I, that was good. It, it was, was good. good. It was very good. I just want to point out, too, that not only, you know, as you're respecting and loving, is, is God going to use that to change your spouse? But I think that when we're doing what God's asked us to do, that he changes our heart as well. You know, he's going to change your heart towards your husband as far as respect and a husband's heart towards his wife as far as loving her. Going. Okay? Going. See, she put it out of, the, out, of the, out of the park this time, out of the stadium. We're in the parking lot now. Good job, Tate. Ooh. All right. <laughs> Next question. Is this helpful, guys? Are you doing all right? Good. Because this is really weird for me. I went, I'm wondering where my pulpit is. I'm like in a chair and stuff, but whatever. Um, we'll keep moving. Number three, here we go. You want to read it, baby? Sure. My husband and I have always had the best relationship and we're truly best friends. But how do you keep the romance alive for the long run and kill the fear and insecurity of infidelity? I think there's a second part to that. Yes, there you go. As a young married couple, I fear flames dying. The good old seven-year itch is around the corner. There we go. In today's society, it seems like 
If it's broke, you get a new one. And mm. that's just awful. How do you guys keep your marriage fun, alive, and thriving? Great question. Um, first of all, thank you for noticing that Tatum and I's marriage is fun, alive, and thriving. <laughs> that's awesome. Come on now. I'll tell you that we, we actually do. We love, we love being married. We love marriage. I tell couples all the time that, that um, other young married couples that you know, I, marriage just gets better and better and better year after year after year. And if you're not experiencing that, you're a married couple and you're not experiencing that, I'm going to tell you right now, that's what God intends for you. Is it your marriage, just, it just gets better and better. We're having more and more fun. And every year I'm like, it's not possible. We can't have more. And it's just, we're just having so much fun together. We absolutely love it. Um, We've only fought one time, and um, or two. I don't remember the second one, but we fought one. T- one t- no, I'm just kidding. Um, so, not just like uh, we'll share with you some of the things in our in our marriage and our our relationship, and um, and first of all, is honestly, and this isn't just stuff like oh, we're in church, we have to say this and make it sound pretty. I, this is honest to goodness, the truth in our, in our relationship is that God is at the center of our relationship. And we've always, always, always put God at the center of a relationship. What does that look like practically? That means like, it means this. I'm going to always be pushing Tatum toward Jesus. And, and she's always pushing me toward Jesus. This girl's devotional life like puts me to shame. And so like, I feel like I have to read my Bible more just by watching her read her Bible because that's just the wife I'm married. And so she's just always pushing me toward Jesus. Here's the beautiful thing about that is that when... Christ is at the center of your marriage. Here's what I know, is that that one time we got in a fight, um, I know that because I'm pushing her to Jesus and she loves God, uh, that when she goes to her father in heaven, she's like, God, what do I do with this guy? And it, What's he going to do? He's going to be like, reconcile. He's going to push her to me, right? God's always going to be pushing her toward me. And so when I have issues and there's things going on and God's dealing with me, God's going to be pushing me toward her. And there's just this rest that we have in our, in our marriage because I know she loves God. She knows I love God. And so I know God's going to always press us into each other. He's always going to push us toward each other. Amen? And so the best thing you could do in your marriage is, and what we do in our marriage, we're always pushing each other toward the Lord in whatever ways we can and, and encouraging each other on in the Lord. So that's one and that's a big one. God has to be at the center and the foundation of your marriage. The second thing I'd say is this, is, is the gospel needs to be alive in your marriage. And again, not just saying this because it's pretty to say on a Sunday morning because it's reality in our, in our marriage. Um, gospel alive in a marriage simply means this, that there's a lot of grace. There's a lot of um, uh, room for forgiveness, okay? You have, like I, I told you I think a while back when or just a couple weeks ago, that every marriage has two really big problems, him and her, right? It's just like every marriage, you just start with these two massive problems, him and her. We're sinners. We bring sin into the relationship. Sin's going to hurt somebody. Someone at some point is going to do something wrong. Can I get an amen? It's going to happen. Maybe not in your marriage or your relationships, but um, she never does anything wrong. I'm always doing things wrong. Um, Do you say that's right? Don't say that. (laughs) I'm going to take away your microphone, girl. That's good. Um, so you got to have the gospel in the center of it. In other words, there's a lot of grace there. So when, I, when I'll do something wrong, um, I've got to be able to know I can go and tell her, hey, I'm sorry. And know that there's going to be grace there to cover that. And say, hey, let's keep moving forward. Let's keep moving forward. Let's keep moving forward. There's always that moving forward. The gospel provides grace for us. Um, there's also the truth. Jesus Christ came, and, and it says, Christ came in John, and it says that he was filled with what? Grace and truth. Do you know what it says in the gospel? It says this, that Jesus came full of grace and full of truth. The gospel provides that grace. The gospel provides also the truth. The truth is, here's what our marriage should look like. And then when you fall, like the trapeze artist, here's what that flip should look like. When he doesn't quite qu- complete it, he falls, he gets caught by a what? A net, that net is the grace. Your marriage has to have both of those things. The truth, here's what we're aiming for, the grace that catches you when you fall. The gospel has to be alive so that you can go at it again and go at it again and go at it again. Some of you have not provided the grace. And so that husband messed up and he fell and he fell and he just, he just like broke some limbs and good luck, buddy. Like marriage isn't going to go nowhere. You got to give grace to it. And truth, so gospel alive in the marriage. Is that helpful? Because honestly, she's provided so much grace for me. And it, it, God has allowed that to mold us um, into one. The two shall become one. And God is shaping us together through, through the gospel in our relationship. So um, is that helpful? Does that make sense? Um, and so absolutely. God, gospel.
I think too, you know, God, God designed the marriage covenant and so, and it's a representation of Christ and his church. And so God wants our marriage relationship not to be something that's like uh, a drag for us. He wants it to be something that's exciting and something that's beautiful. He wants our marriages to thrive, not just simply survive. And so putting these things into practice can be really helpful, you know, especially as you were talking about getting to the seven year itch, you know, getting past that. You're keeping God as a center, gospel as a center. And so God first. And then the other important thing is that each other is second. And um, Chris and I have counseled many couples, and you see uh, relationships start to um, going south when there's something else that gets put into that second position, whether it's the job or it's the kids or it's a hobby or your other friendships. Once you put something else in that spot, uh, it's, it's not healthy for your marriage. This needs to be remain uh, number two in your life, that you are pouring into one another and you're investing into this relationship. And that's so important to be investing in one another. It's not like you get married and you're like, okay, well, that was good. It's a constant, everyday investment that you make to have a healthy marriage. A healthy marriage uh, doesn't just happen. It takes a lot of work. Um, Chris and I have regular date nights, and that's so important. I encourage every couple, date your spouse at least two times a month. Go on a date with your spouse. Get away from everything. And that's a minimum, by the way. Like a minimum. If you go to Citizens Church, you better be dating your spouse at least twice a month. But more if you can. Sorry. It's like a rule, huh? It's a rule. It's like a yeah, rule. that's the rule. We're going to ask <laughs> you on your way in that. in the morning. Are you dating? <laughs> <laughs> so make sure you have that time that you get away and you're, you're looking at each other in the eyes over dinner and you're talking about what's happening in your life. You need to communicate with each other. That's important too, you know, letting your spouse know what's happening in your life and what are your dreams and goals and the things that you're struggling with and make that a regular part of your marriage. It's a good way to nurture and, and invest in your marriage. But Tatum, we don't have money to go on dates. So we like to call our, we have serial dates. So that's where if you have kids, you put your kids to bed. Early. Early. They're like, dad, mom, it's 730. What do we do? Get yourself to bed. We're going to lock you in the rooms because there's things happening downstairs that you don't need to see. So you go upstairs <laughs> and come on and um, we're going to light some candles and get out some Captain Crunch. Like, we literally do this. Like, we literally do this. We and still do this. We, that's what I'm saying. Yes. We literally do this. Yes. We're like, so have a serial date. If nothing else, have a serial date. But try to get, have some date nights in, get away. Um, Chris and I had a crazy love journal that we would write uh, little notes to each other, and then we'll leave the journal somewhere, and then he'll write a little note in it to me and leave it somewhere. So just those little investments go that was a long always, way. That was always so helpful to have when you got in a fight. You know what I mean? Because you'd have the love, the crazy love journal. So it's like she would write in it to me. And then when you're in the fight, you're like, where's that journal at? Because I'd go get it, write a note, baby, I'm so sorry, you know, whatever. And then leave it on the, on the pillow, something. But um, anyway, it's a sorry. Good tip. Yeah, it is good. It is good. Um, I was going to ask you to talk about, Tate. Um, I found in a lot of marriage, marriage relationships, a lot of times, like, you know, my kid's three years old and, and they're not sleeping in the room, but they have a really hard time sleeping at night, you know. Um, We've seen that a lot where, I guess I'm talking about the kid thing. Kids become such a priority sometimes and sometimes dangerously so. And so a lot of times the wives are like, it's just all about the kids, all about the kids, all about the kids, all about the kids. Can you talk to that for a second? Because I know you touched on it, but like expound just a little bit. Yeah, that can, that can be a huge wedge in your marriage. And, and you have to really think, what does that communicate to your husband if you're making your kids such a priority that you you can't go on a date with him because you don't want to leave the kids with somebody or um, the kid sleeps in your bed every single night. And I don't say this pridefully, but we had three kids and none of them slept in our bed because it was a choice that we that we made and we told our kids, you have your own bed to sleep in at night and this is where mom and dad sleep. And so that's just something, you know, I would encourage you moms to step up. Your kids are not going to feel less loved. All three of our kids know that we love them very much. We have a great relationship with them. Um, but they also feel secure, and they know that mom and dad have a really healthy yeah. relationship Amen. and a marriage. And we're exampling to them, um, hopefully, when they get married in the future, what it looks like to have a healthy marriage. And so, moms, the best thing you can give your kids is a healthy marriage Amen. by showing them how much you, you love your hubby. They cry when they're even with the babysitter. Well, you know what? The, the healthiest thing you can give your kid is a healthy marriage. And so, you just got to push through that stuff. Um, they're going to grow up not remembering, mom and dad ditched me all the time. That's not what we remember. Eventually, it's going to equal mom and dad really put their marriage as a priority. And when they, they see you kissing in the hall or whatever it is, and they're like, ew, right? What that really means is, rad, my mom and dad love each other. That's not what they're saying right now, but someday, 
that'll all click. It'll all click. And so, and so marriage, you keep your relationship um, as the priority. So that's good. Another question? Yeah. All right, let's do it. You want to read it? Sure. If you're not married or in a relationship, what type of man or woman should we look for? Advice to unmarried people. How do you know if you are pursuing the right one? Great question for all. Um, now, th this, come on, let's be, it's okay. How many of you are single in here today? Come on, like you mean it, like you just are excited, you're like I'm here, I'm just, come on, raise your hand nice and high. Keep it up, look, look around, look around. Come on, keep it up, high. come on, look around. Okay, so there's some pipe and drape over here on the left side after service today. Y'all are going to meet over there. I'm serious. Like, just get to know somebody. Anyway, um, great question. Like, who, how do I approach this? Um, advice to unmarried people. How do you know if you're pursuing the right one? I would say this first and foremost is before you're worried about pursuing the right one, um, put your focus and your energy on being the right one, okay? Because the, the person that you want to end up with, that person wants to end up with the person that he wants to end up with or she wants to end up with. In order to find the person that you want to end up with, you got to be the person that that person would want to end up with. Does that make sense? Come on, are you with me? So you just got to focus on being the right one, that, first and foremost. And then I feel like I, I find that a lot of times we get so focused on, i got to go find somebody, i got to find somebody, that you end up losing God in the mix of it. And it's just pursue God. He'll bring you the right person at the right time. And I will say this as a side note, um, uh, and even a side note, just a, a point, that marriage is not the goal in life. Finding the one is not the goal in life. I don't know how or why sometimes in Christendom and in the church we've made it feel like getting married is the, like that's the finish line. That's what we're all running toward. That's not the goal, okay? The goal is to love Jesus with all of our hearts, to serve him well and to glorify him with our lives. That's the goal, okay? That's the goal, to, to know God and, and, and enjoy him fully. And that's, that's the goal, to to honor God in, in every season of our, of our lives. Now, that might mean within a marriage. That might mean within the context of singleness. And it might be a season of that. It might be a long, it might be a lifetime. And I know you're, some of you are sitting there going, don't say that to me, you know. Um, I just think it's important to understand that it's okay to embrace where God has you. And um, Paul said this. Paul says, I'm single and loving it. That's what it says in scripture. Um, I'm paraphrasing but Paul says like listen I can get so much done for for the kingdom right now at this season of my life and he actually strongly encouraged people uh hey remain single if you can he says if and um and so I just want to say that um if you're like I need to get married I want to be married well God may have that for you or, and if it's a desire he's put in your heart he's put it there for a reason and um and I'm sure at some point in his time and his way he'll fulfill that but I wanted to say that because I think that we make it the goal, and it's not. Um, does that make sense? Are you with me? Don't hate me. Please don't hate me. I'm just trying to help out. All right, so uh, just, you know, just to address these things. Um, so be the right one. Um, you want to find somebody that, that loves God, obviously, and puts, puts God first, puts Jesus first. And so Tate and I always talk about this. It's called momentum. You need to find somebody who has momentum in their life. Girls, if you meet a guy, and, like, the biggest thing he could brag about is, like, what level he is on some dumb video game. <laughs> Not your man, all right? Can we just, like, let you know right now, who cares what level you are on World of Warfare? I don't care. Like, get a life, you know? Come on, somebody. Like, Halo is like, what are you doing? How old are you? Do not bring that boy home. He's not the right one. You want somebody who has momentum, okay? So it starts like this. Like, they, they love Jesus and they have a job and they work hard, and there's just momentum in their life. you got to find, find people who have momentum. It's important because the momentum of your life is going to line up with the momentum of their life. That's what, that's what happens in a, in, a, in, a, in a dating relationship. You start to go, hey, our momentum's going in the same direction. You're, you're running toward Jesus, and I'm running toward and, the, and there's that momentum. Like, you're going somewhere, and, and we're going kind of the same. If they're not going anywhere, it's hard to run forward with them. Does that make sense? So momentum. And uh, what was another one? And then I would just say, if, how do you know if you're pursuing the right one? I would just say the good litmus test is, what is your family or close yeah, friends a good think? One. You know, is this a good fit for you? Or are they like, hey, I, I don't think this person compliments you. I don't think mm. this is a good relationship. So listen to the people in your life that, that love you and, and that you respect and get their opinion on that as well. All right, next question is this. Is it possible to sustain a loving, healthy, or loving, healthy boundaries with toxic relationships at work with friends 
or even family? Is it possible to sustain uh, boundaries, healthy boundaries? Okay. First of all, I, have to, I think we have to keep in mind that um, obviously the people that we connect with and that we have relationships with influence our life, whether it be for good or, or for bad. And um, 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, bad company corrupts good character. So if you feel like a different relationships that you have in your life are toxic relationships, those are eventually going to corrupt your good character. Bad company corrupts good character. Also, as Chris um, talked about in his boundaries message, Proverbs 13.20 says, walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. And so the people that we surround ourselves with are going to influence us, whether it be good or for bad. And now I'm not sure if the toxic relationship here, I feel like there's a couple different ways you could go with that. Um, one might be someone that's influencing you spiritually. Maybe they're causing you to um, not do things that you know that God would want you to do. And so um, it talks about in the Bible about being unequally yoked. And back in the olden days when they would plow a field, they would put a yoke on two oxen and they would, they would pull. And if one of the yoke was stronger or weaker, it would, cause the, um, you know, it would cause it to turn off the path. And so if you are in a relationship with someone and it's toxic and they're kind of pulling you off the path, then I would say, you know, it's time to put an end to that relationship or an end to that friendship. Um, or even if toxic might mean that somebody is uh, being abusive or they're being controlling it's okay to be able to put an end to relationships that are toxic, that are causing you um, to not um, walk further with the Lord or not be in a healthy relationship. And so if that someone is maybe somebody at work or a family member that you see on a regular basis, um, I encourage you to still be loving and be kind, but just kind of put some distance and put some, some space there. Yeah, we're going to we're gonna, you want to share. We're going to talk good. about within the marriage context, how that plays out. And, and one of the questions actually addresses that. But um, the answer to that question is yes, it, it is possible to put up those healthy boundaries. Once you place them, you need to um, sustain those healthy boundaries. And the way you do that is this, is that you constantly, uh, you need to look at that relationship um, and assess it. Am I being, am I yoked in, in an unhealthy way with this person? And yoked means that you're just influenced by them. Are they influencing me in a negative way? Um, them dragging you down, if they're dragging you down all the time, if it's an unhealthy thing, that's, it's unhealthy. You need to put up a boundary. You put up boundaries with your time. You put up boundaries with your conversation. You put up the boundaries. He who walks with lies will be wise. If you're walking with a fool, you're going to suffer harm. Don't go there. So put up those boundaries. Assess those relationships and continue to um, enforce whatever boundaries you put up. So in other words, I feel like I've let this person back into my life too much and it's, it's affecting me in a negative way. We'll reinforce that boundary, reinforce that boundary. And, and we've got to create that space around our life. It's, it, it's not talked about a whole lot, but it is a biblical concept. It's a biblical um, approach to our relationships. And um, you're watching and you're judging where those lines are based upon how they're influencing you and what their character is. Hopefully that's helpful. Does that make sense? Um, I play devil advocate in this, devil's advocate in this, like, you know, the other side of it, you know, well, how are, how are toxic people ever going to come to know Jesus if we're all just cutting them out of our life, right? Anyone asking that question? Ask that question with me. I'll ask that question. Tatum, how, like, what do what we just, don't love toxic people and good luck? I hope that she finds Jesus somewhere else because we're going to put boundaries and push you away from us. How does that work? I would say that if... If someone is dragging you down, then you're, you're not lifting them up. So you're, you're not being a good influence on somebody if they're, if they're the one that's dragging you down. So if there is a relationship in your life where you feel like you're being dragged down, then I would say it's time to, to release that and say, okay, Lord, I just pray that you'll bring someone else into this person's life that could be a good positive influence on them. Because for me, it's just not, it's not working. And so you really have to assess that. Um, and decide, you know, and, and I would encourage you too. maybe it's something that you need to just go to the person. And I know I had a friend for a while. I felt like every time I got with her, it was like, did you hear about so-and-so? Did you hear about so-and-so? Did you hear about so-and-so? And I just felt like it wasn't a healthy friendship, but it was something that I could talk to them about and that we could, we could move forward and pass that. So maybe it's a, something that you need to talk to someone about it. And if not, if there's no change in it, I would say it's time for you to just release that relationship and, and trust that God will bring someone else yeah, into their really life. Yeah, that's really good. Um, being clear is so good. And we'll move on to the next question. But because you don't start backing off. People are like, what, what's the deal? Where are you going? You got to be able to say, here's why. Here's what's up, you know. And so there's that 
if we can see this change, then hey, we'll be good, but I can't deal with this anymore. And so this is unhealthy. And that's a loving thing to do because now you're addressing maybe some sin in their life or some issue in their life that they're like, well, this is a big deal. I, I can't just keep doing this. I'm hurting relationships. And hopefully that's helpful. Let's hit question number six real quick. We didn't hit this in first service, but let's try this. Um, um, I have in-laws. <laughs> in-laws are great. I have in-laws too, and I love my in-laws. I have in-laws that are constantly telling my husband and I what they think is wrong or what we should do with our new baby. Good luck. <laughs> Next question. Um, <laughs> I want to represent my husband well in his family, but I find myself representing, um, or resenting them and wanting to avoid them, and, some, and sometimes resenting my husband for not sticking up for our family. What's the most biblical way to handle this situation? Great question. That's a good question. In-laws can sometimes be a, a difficult thing. Um, you said not that, in my not case, me. Wow. To be honest, I have amazing Do we have that on video? <laughs> Mom and Dad, I'm so sorry that Tatum just said that. I love my that. in-laws. I really honestly do. <laughs> um, I would encourage um, I would tell encourage me about you. More, tell me more about how difficult they are. I want no, to hear they about. are amazing. And they are how difficult. <laughs> to get me in trouble no you are in trouble <laughs> that's not okay go tell linda at the orange tent that i love her okay <laughs> okay i would say first of all um i'd say examine examine your own heart i would say first just to make sure are are you being overly sensitive are you being unrealistic in your expectations and um i know when chris and i first got married you know i look back i was not an easy daughter-in-law to have i was kind of bratty actually and so I look back now and think man some of my expectations were pretty unrealistic um, for my mother-in-law and I was being overly sensitive about different things that I wouldn't be now um, so if I had made you know I wouldn't want to make a big fuss about those things so I would say to examine your heart and see if these things are, are legit and real and if so then I would talk to your husband and ask his opinion hey do you think I'm being overly sensitive what do you think about this and I think you and your husband kind of need to get on the same page right. with how you feel about right. the in-laws being but involved. But the reality, the reality is at the end of the day, the Bible says this, here's your biblical, here's your biblical like approach, right? It's like they are to leave and to cleave. So the Bible says the husband should leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife. There is a legitimate leaving and cleaving. And so for a marriage to be healthy, for that relationship to be healthy, to be biblical, then that mom and dad play a role in releasing them. Listen, mom and dad, that's one of the hardest things to do. You're releasing your child that you love and you're watching them make mistakes. But guess what? That's how they learn. And your job is not um, to be uh, intruding all the time. That's not like, I'm a good mom and dad. I intrude when my kids. No, you're to inspire, not intrude. Don't intrude. Inspire. You're there. If they need advice, they'll come in. But don't always be like, oh, right? You've got to let them. In other words, when Tate and I get in a fight, if in our early days, if she would run home and mom and dad, Chris is so mean and da, 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 their answer shouldn't be, well, honey, you should just maybe stay here for a couple nights. And, you know, that guy is a jerk and I can't, believe, you know, I've told you about him. They probably did. <laughs> and so they, they, that's not the I answer. Am. The answer is the answer is, babe, I love you. You're married now. Here's what I would do. Now go figure it out. And you push them toward each other, right? Because you've got to let them separate, leave and cleave. Um, yes, you honor mom and dad and you respect them. But mom and dad, you got to give them that space. So talk to, you. talk to the husband. Husband, you set up your own home. You, you guard your, your wife, and you might need to sit down and have a, have a invite mom and dad, invite your mom and dad out to dinner and have a conversation. and say, hey, guys, we're, we're tr we are going to do things a little bit different with our kid, and I get that you, you know, um, might not love all of that, but we've got to figure this out for ourselves and, and have that conversation with them in a loving way and pray over it like crazy, you know, and, and have people praying over it. But you're going to have to have that conversation so that you can biblically live up to this, leave and cleave, set up your own home, and don't let um, in-laws get in there. And listen, their hearts are probably in the right spot. They love you guys, but just guard it. All right, is that all right? Is that just practical? I just, um, it's reality. And so that would be kind of our approach, approach to that. Um, what question should we do, Tate? Maybe we do one more. Sure, let's do that. Next question. I grew up in the faith and fell away, married a non-believer. I'm now seeking to please God first. Says, um, 
How do I treat my husband who doesn't share the same views and goals and change my children's views to godly perspectives when worldly influence is flooding our, our home? Um, I think this, first of all, I'm going to say that, uh, go ahead, next, is there another part of this? I think there's two more parts. It's wireless stuff, and so from the front to the back, they have a hard time. There we go. Next one. Perfect. I know to respect my husband, but how can I lovingly submit and be God-focused at the same time, as in not to um, hurt his place or role in the family as a leader? I'm going to pause on this and say kudos to you, and, and there's so, such maturity in the way that you answered this question even asked this question is where you understand even though that you're unequally yoked you understand still his place within the home as the leader of the home and so you already are on a strong footing you get this and that a lot of people don't get that even though he's not in love with God and has the same values he's still got his place in his head of the home and I love that you've approached it that way and so move on to the next part of this it says can you have a successful marriage if you are un, um, unequally unequally yoked Scripture says this, 1 Corinthians 7, 13 and 14. It says, and if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. Paul's writing to the Corinthians um, who were struggling with all sorts of sexual immorality at the time. And so Paul wrote them in the early letters, in the early part of the letter, and saying that you are not, as, a, as God's holy temple, to um, bind yourself with a prostitute. He says, what, it's, it's not the way it's supposed to be, that there's something happens within that sexual experience that's not just a physical type thing. There's emotions and everything wrapped in there. And he's like, it's just sin, it's wrong. And so now you got these, this, person who loves Jesus is going, well, I go home and I have a husband that doesn't love Jesus. What, what about that? And so here's what Paul is doing. He's writing he, to them and he's saying that the Christian united to Christ, listen, the Christian united to Christ brings the non-Christian partner into a sphere of holiness that neutralizes the Christian's potential to be contaminated. In other words, this wife, you're like, is he, is he, does he contaminate me? Is this bad? What do I, here's what scripture's saying, is that your light will trump his darkness, okay? The light you bring into that relationship as you continue to live out your life in a godly way before him, it has a transforming power. It sanctifies that, that marriage. It sanctifies him as a person. It sets him apart for God to work in an even more intense way in his life by your presence being there and also in the um, context of your children. Your light trumps that darkness. Good trumps the evil, in other words. So Paul is not arguing sanctification or salvation um, by proxy. Like, they're close to you, so they get saved. That's not what he's arguing. But what he's saying, he's making an argument against divorce, that you're not to divorce, you're to continue to shine that light, and your light will shine in a brighter way because they're in that marital context with you. Does that make sense? That's what scripture teaches us. So, continue loving Jesus, continue to shine into their life, continue to pray. Um, Tay, I think you had some practical things you wanted to touch on with that. So what does that mean practically? What does it look like? How do I, how does that? So in the home, if, you, if, you are, if you're loving and respecting your spouse, that is going to speak volumes to them as a non-believer, and it's going to speak volumes to your kids as well. And I would say the ways that you can practically raise your kids up in a home that where when a spouse isn't a believer is just to pour God's word into them, love with love on them, read God's word with them, pray with them, get them connected in church, just make church and 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 the Bible and prayer a part of your life. And I know that that's going to be a huge example to your unbelieving spouse, um, and it's going to minister to your kids. And I think another important thing too is. Um, you might not have religion in common, but there's so many other things in your marriage that you have in common, and I would encourage you to focus on those things because if you're always focused on, well, he's not a believer and he's not going to church and he doesn't pray with me, then it's really your husband or your wife is going to be like, well, that's no fun being a Christian. You're like a bump on the log all the time, you know, mad and upset with me. So I would encourage you, celebrate the things that you that you do have in common, the things that you do, do enjoy together, and trust that, you know, as you're being a good example, that, that God's going to bring Amen. it back around. and. Chris and I have known several couples where there was an unbelieving spouse and, and they came to salvation and, and some of them later on in life. But 
um, just being that constant example and loving on your spouse and um, respecting them, I think will speak will speak volumes Amen. to them. Amen. Timothy, young Timothy knew the scriptures from, from childhood. You know how? Lois and Eunice, so mother and, and a daughter team, grandma and mom were, were giving him his scripture from a young age. They were in a pagan home and raised Timothy to, to, to love the Lord. And so, so there's a lot of examples in scripture where that, where that takes place. Another real practical one, what about tithing? Like you're, you're this way, how do we tithe? How do I honor God with tithe? My husband's in charge of the finances and he doesn't want to give to God. He, the husband's like, I don't even love God. Why am I going to give him money? I don't even know if I like this whole church thing. They just want my money is what he's thinking to himself. And you're thinking, but we need to honor God with a tithe. Well, again, respecting him in that place of authority of overseeing the finances. God knows your heart, ladies, or God knows your heart. I guess talking to this lady, that you would want to be able to tithe, but the husband's in charge and he's not. So God sees that. And, and tithing is about your heart end of the day it's about that worship and so i would say this though i would say to him why don't we try this for a year even if it's less than 10 percent or whatever let's just try it for a year the bible says in malachi says test me on this and see if i will not bless you so just go like this let's try this for a year and let's see if our finances are blessed more at the end of the year than they are right now let's just try it and god just might use it as a way to be a witness to him and god shows up and goes hey look i take care of i take care of you when I take care of my kids when, when you're living in scriptural, scriptural means. But if they're not willing to, they're not willing to. But that's just a, a practical thing. Guys, this helpful today? Is that all right? Let me tell you something as we close. Um, I wish we had more time to do more of these, but we got we to gotta close. And I'll, I'll close with this. Listen to me. Um, the most important relationship in your life is your relationship with God. And none of your relationships on this planet None of these relationships will be healthy until that relationship is healthy. None of these relationships will be right until that relationship is right. You can't expect to have a healthy marriage if you don't have a healthy walk with God. Um, your relationship with God has to be right. And some of you have come here today and you know that you're not in a good spot with God. That, that either you've walked away or that you've never even come um, to the Lord for the very first time to surrender your life. I want to give you an opportunity today before you leave to do that very thing. The Bible says that God loves you so much. He gave his son uh, on your behalf, on the cross, died in your place in order to restore the relationship with him that you were created to have. And some of you need that today. So you can't even try to make these other relationships healthy until you get this right. And this might be your day-to-day -to, -day to get this right. 